Today in Roach Reflections I want to talk a bit more about trotting. It's a huge subject. I hope you don't mind me discussing different aspects of it in various videos. One of the great debates and choices that we have in trotting is how we let the float go down through the swim. In the first bit on trotting in roach reflections I talked about getting the float to go in a straight line and that's obviously the first requirement. Figuring out where the feed's going, figuring out the right depth. But the great debate comes on whether you hold the float back or whether you let it run through and holding back can go to another extreme. A couple of well-known anglers over the years have advocated basically just running the float through. Uh, Owen Wentworth for one, Dave Stewart for another. Get the float going in a straight line, mend the line at least to the float as and when necessary so it's not dragged off course by a bow of slack line. Hopefully the wind is fairly favourable when you're doing this but try and get the float to go pretty much unchecked down through the swim. Owen Wentworth, of course, was famous for fishing with baits like bread flake and bread crust and pounding in massive amounts of mashed bread, probably stiffened up with maybe sausage rusk or stuff like that. Dave Stewart fished on the Stour quite a bit and the Avon and the Thames, of course, he grew up near the Thames. And again, he didn't believe in really holding the float back. I'm probably somewhere in between. I've caught far more roach when I've been holding the float back. Not really holding it back. In most conditions, it just wants easing through a bit. I always call it putting the bait in the fish's mouth. And that just about describes it. And often with the type of Avon floats I use with these fairly fine tips, ones like this one, I can read the bite so the bite will develop over, a, over a, a two or three feet as it goes through and you see it start to dip. When I was very young and I was talking 13 or 14, the slightest movement on the float I would strike and then gradually I learnt, possibly from reading people like Ken Giles and Ivan Marks, that you could see that bite develop Probably the little flickers were okay when I was catching tiddlers, little tiny dacen roach in different waters. But when, it start, when I started to catch bigger ones, I was trying to spot those bites develop. And sometimes the bites developed in ways that are almost impossible to imagine. Uh, on Wareham Key on its very best days, when I'd pounded in ball after ball of ground bait, and the roach were really, really taking the bait my favourite old balsa float on there, the float didn't just go under, the float dragged along and you could watch it being towed along, anything up to a yard before finally zooming away. Incredible bites and yet at the same time this, when I was catching fish on maggots, that was on bread on a 12, fishing with maggots on an 18, the bites would be bare dips, it used to call them think bites, that you'd think the float isn't quite doing what it should do and that was enough. The, the fish was on there and yet when they took the bread they they towed it away. They, they were so aggressive in their feeding. So what we think of as the normal roach fishing method is to just ease it through. The float is shotted normally. It's shotted right down to the where we want it and we're holding it back a little tiny bit and that is probably good enough most of the time because what we're trying to do is replicate the speed of the bait down on the bottom of the river, down on the riverbed. And down there, because of the drag, the friction with the riverbed from the irregularities from uh, stones and changes in the depth and just friction, the water is flowing quite a bit slower than it is at the surface. And it's true that at the surface you can get drag from the wind if you've got a really strong upstream wind. 
you can see that the water is it can on a steady current the water can be almost stationary and yet you know when you put that float in the water it pulls through against the wind of course with a downstream of wind the top can be skimming through which can make life very difficult dragging the line and, and people start to fish wagglers in certain circumstances to cut the line underneath that that skimming wind but if you can work out what speed you want that bait to go through you're trying to replicate speed your float speed to the speed of the current at the bottom so the bait is just bumping along nice and slowly but then we get to a complication which is and this is especially true when a river is quite high and pushing really hard and you, you're going to be limited in how far you can fish out. This is where people can uh, present a bait in a different way with a pole float, especially with a flat, a flat float on the pole. And this is where we're almost stopping the bait. And of course, if you almost stop the float, and like I say, if, if the float is well out from you and you've got that angle to the line, then the float is just going to swing round towards you which we don't really want but if we've got behind it and we stop it then the float's going to tend to lift up out of the water but so how do we counteract that we'd counteract that by adding more weight to our bulk shot so say this one takes says 12 bb on it we might add another 2 bb or at least 1 bb to that bulk shot and then if we don't hold it back at all it's just going to sink out of sight so we're having to hold it back by the amount of that shot. So it's quite a delicate balance, takes quite a lot of skill. This is one thing where a skilled centre pin angler can, can make it work correctly. I can certainly do it with a fixed ball, but it's a lot more concentration than just holding it back a bit in perfect conditions where the float is shotted normally. One example to me that always sticks in my mind of holding a float that's overshotted back I was fishing a winter league 40 years ago it's a long time on the river thames down below wallingford at fairmile and uh, the river had been up and with a good tinge of color the previous saturday and uh, i looked at it and thought blimey this takes some float fishing it's really pushing hard of course the winner had a, a lovely steady inside swim we went and had a look at his swim he had about 16 pound of roach on a stick float nice easy fishing i threw a feed right there and got plenty of bites caught a couple of pounds which at least told me that in that strong current there were fish feeding they, they were dacent roach the following week the river had fined down a bit but it was still pushing it had lost the color we'd, we'd had a frost and uh I didn't have the confidence in a feeder now I'd probably fish it quite differently with maybe a, a bread feeder pegging was quite tight and I worked out that if I had a pacemaker float which this is an Avon but I had a pacemaker float that took three treble A I didn't fish the, these sort of weight floats back then and I overshotted it so it took about six or seven BB probably and I cranked that up to about nine and a pacemaker's got a nice fine tip a bit like this and fishing just under my rod tip and to get my bait down because that's something like 12 foot of water right under my rod tip i mixed up little balls of, of ground bait and put a few maggots in each one just little balls like this mixed really hard this was before we had the continental ground bait so just ordinary brown crumb but mixed very stiffly and I think most people were probably averse to chucking ground bait in but I thought well that will get my bait down in this sort of 12 foot of water and I held back hard fished a 22 and I caught about a dozen quite nice roach for three pound which got me second in a section someone on a corner peg just pit me by a couple of ounces about one roach behind but that's the way it goes but it was an important lesson in holding back that float and getting that bait down in that quite powerful current 
The angler above me fished a, a stick float, probably about five, six, number four. He did catch some roach, they were quite small, I think he had about five for 12 ounces, and he was probably third in the section. So you can see by not bossing the water, by not by being afraid of using that weight and that ground bait, he was at a disadvantage, and so were the other anglers in the section, because they did even worse, of course. So overshotting does work. It's usually one or two BB, maybe a bit more, but it can give you the chance of really slowing that float down instead of it running through like that. And of course, if it was just left unchecked, it's going to go quite quick. The other example I, I can think of of overshotting on the Thames and doing well was a, a friendly Barclays match up above Newbridge on the upper Thames. And we had perfect conditions in October, tinge of colour, nice flow, perfect for a stick float. And I set up a stick float and I started to fish and after an hour I had about five roach for maybe 12, 14 ounces. But I sensed there were a lot of fish there but they just weren't, the presentation wasn't good enough. The stick float went through perfectly. And... I don't think I'd set a pole up. I quickly set up a pole up, found a rig that took half a gram, which is pretty light. That's only a BB and a number four, really. And I had a little olivette on there, a little tungsten olivette, tiny one. And I put some shot underneath that, probably another couple of number four. So quite a bit. We're, we're talking about probably 0.8 or 0.9 grams on a 0.5 gram float. And the current wasn't that fast and fishing at about seven or eight meters and as soon as I put that rig once I got it right it took a while to get the depth exactly right the amount of overshotting dead right and then it went through absolutely beautifully and I started to catch roach not just a few a lot of roach and the two anglers either side of me didn't make the change they just flogged away on their stick floats and they, whatever that presentation on the stick float was, it wasn't right on that, that day. I ended up with 13 pounds with roach to over a pound. Lovely bag of fish, not enough to win. Someone had a load of chub for a little bit more than that. But again, it was this overshotting and slowing it down. So you can't overshot a float at long range far out into the river. And it's probably going to be difficult if it's a long way down the river and if it's both far out and down the river, very, very difficult. It's just, you're not gonna have close enough control. A long rod can be an advantage because you can get right behind it. A pole can be an advantage in, in which case you're probably gonna look at different types of floats like flat floats or Creluso floats. But a conventional pole float can be overshotted, but you need to get fairly heavy on it. Um, although I used half a gram in that example, probably more like one or two grams, one and a half grams, a, a nice round bodied float. The shape of the body of the float does make a difference, these. This one here, one of my favorite floats, and that's got a little bit of a shoulder on it. This one's got a bit less of a shoulder, but that shoulder can help you in holding back a float. So that's something to consider. Some, some Avon floats have more of a, there's no real shoulder, it just tapers gently out. But for really holding back, you want just a bit of a shoulder to hold it back on. Hope I've got you thinking once again. Hopefully the weather will get warmer soon. It's uh, again just a degree above freezing with a biting cold wind, predicting 11 degrees by Monday. So maybe it'll be a lot better and get out on the river. Please click like and subscribe and uh, cheerio for now.